Happy New Year. So this week, I read an article. The article talked about our personalities. It talked about how they're constantly changing throughout our lives. So, like people they interviewed that were 30, they would ask them, is your personality going to be the same from now on? Are you fully developed? And they said, oh yeah, oh yeah, this is who I will always be. <coughs> and then, the people who were 40, just 10 years later, they asked them, did your personality change? And they said, oh yeah, wow, since I was 30, I changed a lot. But now that I'm 40, I'm going to stay this way. I'll be this way forever. Then they ask people who are 50. Have you changed in the last 10 years? They say, oh my gosh, yeah. Since I was 40, I have changed a lot. 30, 40, 50. And they ask them if they would change. And I said, yes, we change. Our personalities change. It's normal. Change happens. Everywhere. You can't stop it every day. That's right. That's right. Something changes. And really, we know our personalities in America are never satisfied. We always want to change something. That's why we make New Year's resolutions. Because we look at ourselves and figure what we want to change. But, the problem is, is that we tend to not be satisfied with our plans. That means we tend to complain and cry and our personalities are not happy and we go to someone and we complain and we cry and we ask them to join, join me in being upset. Or maybe we criticize someone and that person has no clue or groups get together file complaints or talk about someone that the person never knows. We say all these things, but you know I don't have to tell you whether that causes good healthy change or not. You already know this. We just spoil our lives. Some people just live in a style of negativity. Some people just can't experience full joy. The joy that Christ wants to give us. And now, now that it's New Year's, we also try to fit our New Year's resolutions in. We say, how maybe can I be positive? How can I have positive change in my life? So this morning, we have a good example of positive change that comes from a man named Nehemiah. He's in the Old Testament. He has his own book named after him, Nehemiah. And the first four chapters of this show a good change. But, of course, as with many things that we preach about here, does that mean that that's the only, the best way to do things? Well, maybe not, but it's an example. It's an example so that you can learn how to create positive changes in your life. Now, Nehemiah was an Israelite. He worked in Persia, which today is India. Iran, excuse me. He said India, wrong country. But he's there because the Israelites in that country and the other folks, the Babylonians, had conquered them. The Lazar, the Persian army had conquered them, so now they work under the Persians. But the Persian king decided to send the Israelites back to Israel so they could rebuild Jerusalem. And that happened about 15 years before the book of Nehemiah was written. So you'd think in 15 years they'd have a lot built up, but they had some problems. So let's take a look here. Oh, 
I'm sorry, this is kind of an example of what we're going to discuss. We'll go through these points, here are the steps. So the beginning of the book says, in the words of Nehemiah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanai, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Wow. Obviously, the people in Jerusalem that have been there for 15 years working and building new things, and it's not working. Things are still destroyed. There's no wall. There's still no town. So Nehemiah is thinking about this and realizing, wow, it's not working. Something needs to change. Now that cycle that we just showed on the previous slide shows the first step. It means not being satisfied, godly, unsatisfied. There you go, thank you. All right. And that step is important because it sets the stage for the whole process. When Nehemiah heard what was happening in Jerusalem and how terrible it was, the things were still destroyed and burned by fire, what do you do? Let's take a look. Next slide. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Okay, so he's obviously not satisfied. That's good. When we don't take care of ourselves, we don't feel good, we don't feel satisfied. But when we go to the hospital, and that hospital does not provide an interpreter, we really are unsatisfied. When we show someone love, but they don't sh maybe show love back, yeah, we don't feel satisfied. But when we see someone who can't find a job, who's working and searching, and still can't find it, and they're not getting any help, we should not be satisfied. That's kind of the point here, is that we should not be satisfied with problems, especially when we are involved in the problems. We should be concerned about that. So the first step is not to be satisfied. We should not see these things and feel be able to feel satisfied. We need to be so concerned that we want it to change. Not, oh, you know, yeah, that's not good, but it's not really a big deal. Then obviously nothing's going to change because we don't really care. We need to feel touched. We need to desire strongly a change. But... We need to add the word in there, godly dissatisfied, which means it's not a selfish dissatisf dissatisfaction. Satisfaction. We don't think, oh, I'm not really interested in helping. It's not really a big issue for me. It doesn't really concern my family. You know, it's not right, but, you know, we really look and see how things impact us and what we like and what we prefer. And that's not the kind of satisfaction that we are, should be seeking. That's not godly satisfaction. 
if maybe we can make things a little bit better, but we want to stay the same. If someone tries to help us change our lives, we shoot them off because we're so focused on ourselves. That is not godly satisfaction because there's no compassion involved. It's really not feeling strongly that we want to change. So Nehemiah is upset here. And why was he upset? Because God promised to give them back Jerusalem. But it's being destroyed. They're not happy with God's plans. These folks are worried about their own plans. Nehemiah is focused on God's plan. And that's why it's called godly dissatisfaction. When we want to change something in our lives here at church, we make sure that what we try to change for is the better. But if you notice that Nehemiah heard this bad news, and what did he do? He didn't accuse people. He didn't say, oh, they're so stupid. 15 years, they made no progress. He criticized and complained. He didn't blame anyone. He just prayed. He mourned and prayed. Now, I'm not going to tell you the full story of Nehemiah. Later, if you happen to be reading it, you'll notice all of these steps. Every step, Nehemiah always prays. That means he didn't make a plan and sit there and wait for it to happen. Nehemiah prayed that God's plan be his plan also. His prayer showed sacrifice. That he wanted God to use us. He wanted to be involved in God's process. Okay, so the second step for change is ownership. Meaning we have to accept our role. Our role in the problem and our role in the solution. Let's see what Nehemiah prayed about. He said, God, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself in my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. So again, what is Nehemiah doing here? He's not blaming anyone. He's owning the responsibility of himself and his family. He's owning it. That he was a part of the problem. Any problem that we see that we want to change... We need to recognize that we are part of the problem also. Our family relationships may be not being good. We need to analyze what our role is in that situation. Maybe something here at church you don't like. What is your role in that problem? We see here that Nehemiah has done something. He's accepted ownership of the problem and now he's also going to become part of the solution. He understands he needs to be involved. He needs to do something if he wants to see change. He needs to change too. So we recognize that Nehemiah wants to change. Now, he worked as a 
cupbearer for the king. So like before the king would eat, Nehemiah would taste things and see if they're poisonous, or he would drink the king's drink to make sure it wasn't poisoned. Now Nehemiah wanted to ask the king, do you mind if I go back to Jerusalem and help him? But man, that was a big request to ask. So he went in to the king, we got the next slide here. And the king asked him, he recognized that Nehemiah was heartbroken and asked him, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. Nehemiah said, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king said to him, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. Again, Nehemiah prays before he does anything. It's very obvious that he wanted to risk his life and his career to confront the king to say, I have something I need to be a part of. Now the third step is to label the problem. What's the cause of the problem? Diagnosing the problem. Kind of like you know how a doctor will diagnose you when you're sick. You need to diagnose the problem. Now we look to chapter, the next slide. Chapter 2 here says that Nehemiah went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Now I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically what Nehemiah is doing here is he's taking upon himself through the night in private to go and see what the problem was, to try to diagnose the problem. Now, if you notice, keep up the next slide. Okay, so as he is looking and examining the problem, and he already knows what the diagnosis is for this problem, he realizes he can't do it himself. And he says, to all the people in Jerusalem, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. And the people replied, well, let us start rebuilding. So that's how the process really works. You see in the final verses, the very important verses, that it takes all of them. If Nehemiah tried to do it all himself, it wouldn't have worked. But he says, let us, let us start rebuilding. If we want to change something, we can't do it ourselves. We need to help other people. We need to help other people accept their roles. And get them involved. 
Now, if your relationships are no good, you say, come on, let's change it, let's make it better, then it might be tough. Maybe it won't work out just right. But it's important to follow step by step by step. Well, remember what step two was? Own your role in the problem. But we have to include others as well. You know that there's something in church that we want to see changed or added or whatever. It's not just the pastor's job. Yeah, pastors will listen to ideas and concerns and please, we want to hear the feedback. But when it comes time to change, the pastors are going to ask everyone and say, let us rebuild. And we have to work together. We need to be enthusiastic about working together for God's vision and doing that. Now, once everybody's involved and ready to work, then the last two steps are develop a solution and do it. So in the end of this chapter, there's so many details about how they rebuilt the wall. And I'm not really going to share all of these since there's so much. But I want to share a little bit, a few interesting things. Now read through this, and as you're reading through it, you'll recognize all these names that it lists. It gives very, very detailed information. The reason the details are important, because often our solutions have to be detailed. We can't just leave it to God and say, God fix this. We have to plan and be meticulous. And of course, God will guide us. But we have to be willing to do the work as well. Now, the sentence says the high priest. The high priest went to work on building. The ruler of the district went to work on building. Another group, the nobles. We see this, we think, wow. So if you remember one story in the New Testament where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. I love that story because... Jesus said that no servant is above the master. And if Jesus is our master, yet he was willing to wash our feet. When we are his servants, that means we need to be willing to do anything. That story shows us that no one is too good to do work. Everyone needs to be involved, no matter what their status is, no matter who they are, we all need to get involved. The next one says a goldsmith, person who worked with gold, person who made perfumes, Person who made perfumes got involved with rebuilding this wall. He could easily said, "Oh, I don't know how to do this stuff. This is not in my forte. Do it yourselves." But of course, God will use us for our skills and gifts. But sometimes, when we want to change something, we have to use things and skills that maybe we're not the best at, but we can learn. Sometimes people who make perfumes need to build walls. And the last little scripture here says, that people make repairs opposite their house. Sometimes the world is terrible, and we want to change it, and that's good, and we need to focus on the world. 
But often the change needs to happen where our own home is. It means Olefa. That means our personal homes. Mine now, 105th Street. We need to be involved in change. When we have problems in our own homes, we can focus, accept our roles, and do work. Now, if you read through the rest of this chapter, you'll recognize all these different people that have their own role. And sometimes they may not always be comfortable with that role. Maybe it's forced upon them. But we know that God is working with us every time. And now my challenge for us for this new year is that if someone in our lives, our family's lives, our church life, our school life, our work life, if there's something you want to see changed, then we know our first step is to not be satisfied. To want to change. We know that we need to mourn and be involved and accept our role, and then we can start the process of change. Amen. Okay, so now we're coming to the communion table. Anyone is welcome. Kids who have not yet been baptized or, or not ordained, what's the right sign? Confirmed. Can still come through the line and we will bless them. But anyone is welcome to the Lord's table. And now remember that night when Jesus was crucified the night before when he ate with his disciples. At that time, Jesus took the bread, broke it, gave thanks, saying, This bread is my body. Eat this and remember it to me. During that same night in Jerusalem, while the disciples of Jesus were eating, Jesus took the cup, looked to heaven, and gave thanks. And said, this is my blood of the new covenant spilled for you. Now let's begin. You don't feel too wild flat. 